TV. Food prices have increased 25 times faster than profits. And at Loblaw, none of those profits came from higher food margins. Our retail prices have not risen faster than our costs. So no matter how many times you read it on Twitter, the idea that grocers are causing food inflation is not only false, it's impossible. It started to, prices started to climb probably around June of 2022, a few months after uh, the invasion of Ukraine, basically. The entire world was impacted by that invasion, uh, even though access to food wasn't an issue in Canada, it did impact commodity prices. Uh, a bushel of wheat was $13 US for several months. Uh, so. Uh, a bushel of wheat was $13 in, uh, in Europe, but it was also $13 in North America as well. And so people may think, well, Ukraine is far away from us. It didn't impact us. Well, it did because of, of input costs. And I would say we actually reached our climax in January of 2023 when food inflation went up uh, to 11%. Uh, so that was the highest we saw in Canada. In some parts of the world, like Germany and France, they, they saw their food inflation rate reach 21, 22%, if you can believe that. So it was actually much worse in, in Europe. As Canadians struggle with the cost of living, grocery bills have become a particularly notorious source of frustration. The price increases seen in grocery store aisles have left consumers in unprecedented territory. So if we look at things over like a longer timeline of say three or four years, you're talking about almost a little bit more than 20% um, increases in food prices. Uh, so compared with April 2020, prices are about 20% higher, a little bit more than 20% higher. But that also masks some of the larger increases that we're seeing in specific components okay. so so things like edible fats and oils which would include you know like your canola oil or your vegetable oils those sorts of things they've increased by almost 80 percent uh between now and and 2020 um pastas similar pastas prices have increased about 40 percent uh and there's a handful of other commodities that have behaved similarly So we've been following food prices for 15 years. And you know, every year we'll, you'll look at one star category that actually has pushed prices higher. But in 2023, it was everything, really. It was everything, even frozen, which is rare. I mean, talk about one stable supply chain. Uh, frozen foods were more expensive, so it really is uh, a whole of, of store sort of problem. Uh, you, there was no safe place to go at the grocery store in 2023, which is why, again, people just ran out of options and they, they knew that they had to spend more for whatever they wanted to buy. We are having more folks accessing food assistance than ever before. More than 58,000 individuals accessed a food assistance program more than 450,000 times last year, which was about a 40% increase from the year before, and we're expecting another large increase next year. Uh, but the reality is food costs are at an all-time high, and folks sometimes don't have enough to get what they would like to in their weekly groceries, let alone make an additional contribution to pick something up for the food bank. And it's affecting us from a financial perspective, but also a food perspective. We use financial donations to help fill the gaps in our inventory system. Um, to, when we are low on product, we're able to purchase that, but with donations not keeping pace with the number of folks that are accessing food assistance, food donations not keeping pace with the number of folks who are accessing food assistance, I am concerned about what the next year, two and three years is gonna bring.
We're up by almost 54%. So we have gone from about 800 households a month to easily almost 1300 households a month so you know when you start you know, getting into the thousands of households um, you know you start to look at okay what's happening right what what's the impact and obviously I think for a lot of people um, you know this increase in the cost of living has really impacted um, them and their ability to provide for themselves and their families. So we've really seen, um, you know, the number of people uh, and the types of people change. It, the interesting piece actually that we're seeing is the number of single individuals that are using the food bank has increased quite a lot. And I think that has a lot to do with, uh, you know, this increase in housing and, and food pricing. If you consider, you know, one a one income household, you know, their rent goes up, their food pricing goes up. There's not a lot of give, there's not a second income there to kind of help offset some of that cost. So we're seeing that number actually go up um, people on fixed incomes um, you know that is difficult because again there's no adjustment made there for you know increased costs for living um, so those are the those are the groups that we're seeing the heart that are hardest hit we are seeing more people who are working more people who um, you know they're maybe holding down like you said a couple couple different jobs and they are trying you know to just again make ends meet and yeah they're having a difficult time with it I'd say, I mean, overall, um, we just saw an industry recalibrate uh, with higher input costs. And that actually, it took time to uh, see these prices work their way through the supply chain. It takes a while. So it's, so when you walk into a grocery store, you have 20,000 different products and each vertical will have its own story. and its own ability to absorb shocks. Uh, like for example, I'll give you one ex simple example at the meat counter. If input costs go up in chicken, if feeding chicken costs you more, it will take probably a matter of, of a month or two to start seeing retail prices being impacted. But with beef, for example, since the cycle is two years, it may take nine, 10, 11 months before you and I start seeing beef prices go up. And so feeding cattle last year was very expensive. And that's why right now we're seeing beef prices going up right now. Global supply chain disruptions, climate change, extreme weather conditions, the war in Ukraine, and high oil and gas prices have magnified global food insecurity. But how has grocery pricing played into that? In March of 2023, a standing committee on agriculture and agri-food was formed to investigate the concerns of price fixing with the CEOs of Canada's three grocery chains and two American superstores, Costco and Walmart. Your company is making $1 million a day in excess profits. No one feels sorry for your profit margin when you're making a million dollars, not just in profit, in excess profit a day at the same time that Canadians are experiencing the most unprecedented inflation in their lives. How can you look a family in the eyes and tell them that that's okay, what you're doing is okay? I had a, a conversation with a customer in a store just the other day. Um, she came to me and she said something similar. She said, how can you have such exorbitant profits? And I sat down, I didn't sit down with her, but we chatted uh, for about 15 minutes and I explained, um, you know, what I'm explaining here to the committee and she, she understood. Um, and she said, she said, okay, I didn't realize that. That's not the way it's being characterized. Kitchener Conestoga MP Tim Lewis was a part of the Agricultural Committee. Their investigative approach, farm to fork costs. What we found was that at the producing level, at the farmer level, they're not making more money. Right. And at the consumer level, consumers are paying more. So somewhere in the middle, where, where is that money, where is that extra money going? So we did, we, we, uh, we invited and, and, and heard from all five, there's five major grocery chains that make up uh, over, I think it's 80% of the market. So um, it's, uh, it's pretty oligopolistic. 
uh, in nature and we wanted to hear from them and hear what they're doing and the concrete measures we're trying to take is to strengthen the Competition Act as a government. We uh, implemented this called the Affordable Housing and Grocery Act, which also strengthened the Competition Act to make sure there's more transparency and to encourage more uh, well, more competition is, is one of the things. So, so we want to see that we've got a, a food data hub that we can that, that consumers can see where prices should be at and then comparatively shop. And we've even asked Consumer Affairs in Canada to look at the the size of packaging and that's shrinkflation right. because as consumers became more attuned to the prices and started doing more comparative shopping, we're noticing that some of these products end up having less less per. Uh, mm -hmm. per unit kind of thing. So, mm -hmm. so, uh, so those are some of the things we looked at. Making sure that these grocery stores, which represent 80% of, mm -hmm. of the market, uh, are operating in fair ways. We heard that the relationships they had with the distributors, with the producers, with our farmers, uh, there's an imbalance there, a bit of a power imbalance there. So a grocery code of conduct is a set of rules that we're working with provinces and the industry itself to, to regulate and make sure that they're operating in a fair and transparent way. In Canada, there are three large grocery chains, Loblaw, Metro Inc., and Empire. Loblaw is the parent company of chains such as Zares Markets, Shoppers Drug Mart, Fortino's No Frills, and Real Canadian Superstore. Metro Inc. owns Metro, Metro Plus, and Food Basics, among others. Empire owns a number of chains, including Sobeys, Longos, IGA, Farm Boy, Freshco, and Foodland. And that's one of the things that we're looking at when we're trying to give more teeth and more resources to the Competition Act because mm -hmm. uh, one of the recommendations we had was if a company was going to buy out a sm another a smaller grocery chain and bring them under the umbrella, possibly keep the same name so you didn't know they were two different companies, uh, I'd like to see the onus put on the company to prove that, that there will still be competitiveness as opposed to the opposite where it's up to the Competition Bureau to prove that they are not uh, allowing competition to happen so uh, so those kind of ways of strengthening with the Consumer Affairs Act uh, or also with the, with the competitive uh, competition mm -hmm. act it's important that those companies get held accountable and also we're looking at ways of inviting other companies more competition into Canada to see if we can do that to, to bring in other other, other grocery companies, which would, again, which help would stabilize prices and give right. consumers more choice, and that's what it comes down to at the end. Food prices have left many unable to pay for the basic necessities. The sticker shock on some of the household staples has changed the way people are shopping. A national boycott against Canadian grocery giant Loblaw and its subsidiaries that started online is gaining momentum. Loblaw has been under public and political scrutiny as it posts large profits amid rising food prices. According to Statistica, Loblaw Companies Limited achieved net earnings of just over $2 billion in 2023. The organizer behind the boycott, Emily Johnson, has gotten a petition in front of the House of Commons. It calls for laws to prevent exploitive practices in the food retail sector, such as price fixing and shrinkflation, and for an end to grocery monopolies. Uh, it's hard to measure the success of a boycott like that. I mean, there's a lot of anecdotal evidence for sure. A lot of, and frankly, some media are kind of spinning this as a successful boycott. I, I don't even know why they are doing that because there is no measurable, measurable evidence that the boycott is working. And frankly, what we're seeing since January 2023. Uh, of our positive signs around people going beyond the big five. So the big five, Costco, Walmart, Metro, Sobeys and Loblaws, people are starting to understand that there are other options beyond the big five. So they're going to independent grocers, but we have seen an increase in traffic towards uh, independent grocers since probably February or March of 2023 when food inflation was really at its peak, really. And so right now we're seeing reports that uh, more uh, more people are going to independent grocers because of the boycott. It's not because of the boycott, it's just because food prices went up significantly last year. So that's not necessarily a bad thing, to be honest, because we need more stronger options for consumers. 
every level of government has a responsibility to listen to people and as consumers if that's what they wanted to do and make a statement that through boycotting is a, is a valid way of doing that uh, it shines a light on on how few companies are actually uh, a players you might hear of different grocery chains but they're all under the same umbrella of five organizations three Canadian ones and two American um, so just like in the pandemic I think people realize that you know their food didn't come from a grocery store it came from a local farmer and so they realize the importance of protecting our land and supporting our local farms, especially here in our region. Um, but with things like this boycott, it makes people realize how few companies are there and, and there is a bit of lack, of, there is definitely a lack of trust uh, between Canadians and these groceries. We, we heard of the bread scandal over a decade ago and uh, there was a hero pandemic pay that happened early on. and, and Coincidentally, possibly not coincidentally, uh, that hero pay stopped. All the companies stopped around the same, almost the same to the day. Uh, so we have to be careful that they're not in collusion and, and it's at the expense of consumers. It's hard to understand and when you actually look at the facts, when you look at the history of food distribution in Canada, if you are to boycott one banner, it would be Walmart because Walmart's arrival in 1994 forced Canadian grocers to consolidate, forced Loblaw to become the the mammoth it is today. And so, and now we have uh, Minister Champagne dialing for grocers, increasing competition in Canada. And that's exactly what happened 30 years ago. We basically saw this American invasion led by Costco and Walmart that led to more consolidation. So it's, it's a hard, it's, it's, I would say right now, I, I, as a scientist in food distribution, I'm, I'm very confused with what we're trying to accomplish here. In addition to boycotts and sourcing food from independent grocers, some organizations have developed a program to help those facing the most extreme forms of food insecurity. So the SEED is a project of the Guelph Community Health Centre and our vision is a community where everyone has uh, access to the food they need to be well. And we're trying to create systems where uh, more people can access the food they need by using programs and social enterprises that are designed to increase the affordability of food uh, to people. So some of the ways that we've gone about doing that is by creating a sliding scale market. So people can come to our market locations and they can pay anywhere from the cost of food that it cost us to buy all the way up to retail, where uh, the people who are paying retail rates for food are generating some income for our program uh, that help offset the, the cost of operating it. And then people who uh, need lower cost food, they can access it at a lower cost as well. So we're involving the whole community in that kind of solution. But we're also trying to, like we're, I'm standing in a, a giant warehouse here, uh, and we use this space to support many of the other initiatives that exist uh, in Guelph and Wellington, where uh, we're bringing in $2 million in donated food this year. Uh, we have a program where we buy and then resell at a low margin to our community partner agencies that are then giving away that food for free as well. Uh, we support kitchen-based programs where some of the donated food that is coming in isn't of a retail value or isn't of a, a quality that uh, we deem high enough to give away to, to people, where they're chopping the ends off things, they're creating delicious, beautiful, uh, value-added meals uh, as a result of that. So we're trying to fill gaps in terms of uh, the access to food and in different ways um, through our programming. Yeah, we've definitely seen a growth as a result of uh, the inflation that's occurred over the last uh, two to four years, uh, resulting from the pandemic and uh, all of the additional costs that exist within the supply chain. Um, so for an example, uh, we have an online grocery store uh, where we're applying that sliding scale model of pricing, uh, where we have people that are getting 33% off the cost of food and people could pay retail rates as well if, if they are able to, uh, and anywhere in between that. and. Uh, we have a certain capacity here at the seed to meet demand. And once we've met that capacity, we had to create a wait list uh, for people who could get that discount, that deep discount. And what we've seen over the last little while is that wait list grew to about 800 households. We managed to get about 400 households off that wait list. And over the last six to eight months, we've seen it grow back up to 800 households. Um, and that's just our own wait list. 
there are 20,000 or more people in Guelph and Wellington who face the issue of food insecurity that we don't have the capacity to, to meet that demand. I think it's, it might be now more so that we're seeing a lot more people on the marginal uh, food insecure side of things where this has been a problem for decades where people have faced marginal food insecurity and, and the other uh, side of the spectrum as well. Uh, but I think with inflation, we're seeing more and more people really at that marginal space where they're just, because their rent is so high, because electricity bills have uh, increased, because general cost of living has increased uh, with respect to their fixed uh, costs, those variable costs, like food, you can make sacrifices. It's not the best for your health, but it's one of the options you have to just get the calories you need in a week. So then if people are making sacrifices on quantity and quality, um, that's what's happening. So we're just seeing more and more people, I think, that are right on that marginal side of things. My biggest concern is nutritional security, to be honest, because I, I, I don't think that people are, are buying less food, but they're spending less on food. And what does that mean to, to the health of Canadians? So are they buying calorie-rich, nutritionally poor products? That's likely the case. So over time, are we going to pay for that with, uh, with or more health care costs? To me, that's really the big challenge right now. Because, uh, uh, I, mean, I mean, on the one side, I'm trying to I explain to people what's going on with the supply chain. But on the other hand, you are clearly seeing signs that consumers are completely retreating. They're just going after Dolorama. They're, they're, just, they're just spending less on food. So the, the, the average Canadian this year should be spending about $339 a month to support a healthy diet. Okay, $339. We're at $242 right now. Okay, that gap is going to cost us all more money uh, with healthcare support in, in future years. That would be my guess. That's my, that's my biggest concern right now. With fixed income, seniors on fixed income, it's really, again, creating that situation where, you know, when food prices go up, you know, the first thing that people think about cutting is the grocery bill. How do we reduce what we spend on food? And, you know, I think that that's really important. And, and then you think about what that ripple effect might be. What does that do to someone's health? energy levels, ability to learn for students. There's a lot that happens with, uh, with people when they start cutting back you know, on, on food and groceries. The big question everyone is asking is how long the state of food insecurity is going to last and where do we go from here? Food inflation is down to 1.4%, which is really, um, I think encouraging. I, I know a lot of people aren't necessarily seeing it that way, but uh, when you actually look at uh, year to year drops, it's 1.4. But when you look at the last two months, uh, food prices have actually gone down 0.3% uh, in March and April uh, as well. So you can t you can tell that food prices are are have stabilized essentially, giving a chance for consumers to to adjust. I just, I, th I just think it's the market. I, I think the number one factor are consumers themselves. Uh, consumers uh, have been uh, shocked at the grocery store for well over a year. And when that happens, basically you, you'll trade down. You'll, you'll just go to other places where you wouldn't have gone before to buy food, essentially. That's what's been happening. And frankly, uh, when we talk about the cost of living, I mean, the biggest challenge for consumers uh, is, uh, is shelter in particular, debt as well. Interest rates have actually gone up significantly. Which is why when people show up at the grocery store, they actually have less money to spend on groceries, not not more. And so that's why people may actually feel that it's actually quite painful at the grocery store and that pain is increasing 
But the data is actually telling us that things are improving, but people don't feel that way because of other things happening in their lives that are way more complicated than, than before. I, I do see the demand being, um, well, I see it at the very least staying the way it is and, you know, worst case, see it increase. And part of the reason for that is just going back to that idea of food insecurity being an income-based issue. Uh, people's wages haven't kept pace with the rate of inflation. So in order for people to afford the food that they afforded in 2020 or 2019, their wages need to increase, you know, as much as inflation increased over that period of time, right? Um, and it just hasn't happened. So there's this period of time that we're going through right now where people's wages are lagging behind inflation. Uh, and unless that changes, uh, we're going to see the demand right now um, stay the way it is or increase. As a committee, again, what we studied is we went and studied right from the farm itself to production uh, and processing right down to the grocery chains. So each step of the way, there's a combination of, of making sure there's enough labor, making sure that uh, the inputs are in place, the supply chains are there to supply whoever it is what they need, uh, and making sure that the tech is there, but we also support those techs, so whether it's automation, whether it's uh, uh, any kind of solutions that we're doing, we want to make sure that the government's there to help so those producers themselves aren't paying those costs up front. So those are the lessons we learned. Uh, we learned to try and tighten the circle of, of our production and food and grow more at home. We had some, some processing for, uh, for there were challenges with cross-border. Right. Uh, so we're looking at more food sovereignty as Canadians and see where we can do that. Also, we have the challenge of sometimes we're growing the food, we're sending it to the states to be processed and they're selling it back to our own consumers. So we're looking at ways that we can keep that the whole chain in Canada and that's more jobs and that's more food sovereignty. Uh, there's a lot of benefits to that. So I think, you know, from the perspective of food banks, right, not just ours, but food banks across the province, across the country, we know that, you know, the system is broken. And what pieces of the system are broken, right, we have to take a look at that. You know, when people aren't provided for with a basic human need of food, um, something's not right. And to me, that continued um, support of programs that help lift people out of poverty um, to try and, and ensure that social assistance rates are high enough that people you know, can pay their rent and have food in their homes, um, being able to ensure that jobs are plentiful, that there are, you know, that the, the economy is working well, all of those things, you know, play a role and are factors in, you know, the ability for um, for people to lift themselves out of this situation. And and I think those are all. It's very complex. It's poverty is not simple solution. It's it's a very complex issue, um, and we've seen that with food prices and how housing prices and rents and all of those things, they're complex, they're not simple things to fix. And I think that's something that we need to recognize. Um, there's no silver bullet to this. We have to start, you know, really looking at our whole system and figuring out how do we, how do we move things forward to be able to ensure that everyone is provided for. This program is brought to you by Ignite TV. Now you're in command. Visit rogers.com for more details. Connect with us by visiting our website or email us at comments at rogerstv.com.